You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. We hope you enjoy this week's show and you can find out more about us by going online at beardedtheologians.com where you can pick up a few t-shirts, listen to a few old episodes, and find ways that you can connect with us. Thank you for listening. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. So uh, this week on the podcast, we're uh, going to talk about um, really kind of how to handle uh, legacy uh, within our churches. And what we mean by that is how we can look towards our past, but not be held by it to create a new future. Um, and so Zach, as you uh, think about that, as your church is getting ready to do 165 years next uh, next year, years, and my church is in the middle of celebrating 150 years, like how do you, how do you manage that with your congregation and how you've done that in the past? Yeah, um, having had the privilege of of serving several churches now that are a hundred plus plus years old, it's really uh, it's a fascinating exercise. Um, in any church I go into, regardless of age, I always take a look at the pastoral history and who has served here uh, over over the years. Whether that's been you know a church that's fifty years old or a church that's one hundred and sixty five years old, and um, begin to look at dates and how long people served and um, what that kind of meant for the community and what was going on in the community and uh, why people were here. And, um, and then the, you know, hearing, hearing from your church people of, um, you know, not reaching back into the good old days, right. But hearing what was vibrant and what was good and what was going on is, is super helpful as we uh, lean into uh, our churches and communities. And I think it tells us a whole bunch about how we move forward in, in ministry and community together. Uh, and the thing that we, we have a hard time in the church world with is getting stuck in the past, um, getting stuck in the ways that we've always done it, which honestly is probably an untrue statement if we really looked at it, because the way that we've always done it probably isn't true. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, we've done it a certain way, but it's, it's ebbed and flown and, uh, and grown and changed over time, and it just feels like we've always done it that way and um and we're holding holding on to something that's not really real um and so as we we take a look you know my my church here in Bozeman is going to celebrate uh 165 years next year um and and as we look at that we're going to we're going to start having the conversation what do the next 165 years look like and and fully knowing that it's going to be a different world. I mean, 165 years ago in Bozeman, Montana, completely different world than it is today. And I know that's silly to say out loud, but I think we forget that. Uh, I think we forget that in our time and our history. And yet what is the same uh, is the message of the good news that we're bringing to this community and um, and how, how we do that has changed and where we do that has changed and hopefully grown over the years. And I think it's a viable and a valuable conversation to to have. What is what does it look like over the next five, ten, one hundred and sixty five years uh, to make sure that there is a United Methodist Wesleyan presence of love and grace in in the valley here? And um, that means a lot of a lot of things. Taking and learning from what we've done, and learning how the world around us is changing and where we fit into that. Uh, and all of the ways that that we do um, and that we don't know yet. I think that's the big the big thing when we look at uh, at our history, whether that's historical past and moving into the future is is how do we how do we fit uh, and how is that going to grow and change over time? And uh, we have to know where we come from to do that. And so that's I mean, that's foundational work of of past to present to to future. And so, Matt, as you as you think about legacy, uh, moving into the future, celebrating what we've where we've been, and and how that takes us into where we're going, what comes to mind to you? You know, um, I've been glad. Like so, the last this church uh, here in Castle Rock is we're in the middle of our 150th celebration, and um, one of the beautiful things about it has been. 
the way we've structured our celebration. It's not just one big one-off thing. We've made it a year round thing to where we've um, taken, we, we identified several things that are part of a, who we are. And one of the, it's music, uh, looking at our history. Uh, we did a service project. We had a social event, the ice cream social we just had last Sunday. And then we're gonna have our birthday party. And when we tied that all in, what's really been nice is that it's allowed us to connect and reconnect with people that we hadn't talked to in a while. Or um, and, and so what it's really done is allowed us to look back, but not be held back by it. Like we don't want to go back to where we were. Um, and on Sunday, I shared this quote from uh, Michael Howes. He says, a focus on the future prevents a church from becoming a resting place for rusty relics. And I think what happens in the church is, is we have a thing, whether it's a rusty relic or whatever it is you're going to call it, um, and we hold on to that thing, even if the thing is no longer viable or healthy or sustainable. And so instead of moving forward, which is really what we, really what our faith is about, we just, we become sedentary. And what happens with that sedentariness, and Zach, you know, just as well as I do, because you've been in some of those churches that are just dead mm-hmm. and they smell musty. They smell, they, they look horrible. Um, and, and so the thing to draw from our churches is that like in order for us to be vibrant and to be alive, we had to look at the past, say that was great. However, that's not who we are anymore, and we need to move forward. Um, I think, I, I think too often we hold on to the past in such a way that it becomes debilitating for churches and church growth. Uh, and maybe it's because we don't want to change. Maybe it's because we don't want to do the new thing, or we don't want to change the way we're doing ministry, even though we've had such a vital decline in spaces where in any other industry, if there was the kind of decline the church was having, there'd be a new product by the end of the year. Um, the church doesn't do that very well. And it's because we hold on to those relics. And so how do we, I, I think the conversation becomes, how do you hold on to the relic saying it's an okay thing, but it's not what needs to define us now in this space and, and to move, look forward and move on. Um, and, and, and I turn to um, uh, Philippians, uh, I'm going to go biblical here, uh, turn to Philippians 3. I mean, granted, this is still fresh in my mind from Sunday's sermon, so like, don't think that I had this already planned out. But uh, Philippians 3, where, where they talk about the goal really is to follow Jesus. Like That's the goal for our faith. And I think that when you're doing these kind of celebrations, asking ourselves, like, how, what, is it, what, do you, what do we think it's going to look like to follow Jesus 10, 15, 20 years from now? What are we going to do? What do we need to? What do we need to adapt? Um, and and how can we be relevant in this day and age? And I know, like sometimes, relevant becomes an anti buzzword. Uh, it scares people, but there is a sense of relevancy because we don't talk in the these and vows uh, like the King James does. Uh, we've obviously um, have evolved, um, and so how do we? I think it's just looking at that and saying, "Yeah, that's we did that. That was great." Or we. I also think too the one thing uh, that we also need to honor and, and, and show a sign of respect for her is to acknowledge the harm that we've caused in the past. And and I've been reading a lot of Sand Creek material lately just to get familiarized with that being in the area where the Sand Creek massacre happened, uh, and that did have a profound effect on the church. And so, how can we honor that? They are, you know, have a sign of repentance, but also move forward from that. And I think as we work with our congregations and even ourselves, like, it's like you're not the same pastor you were when you first started. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you don't even think the same way as you did in kindergarten, although your wife would, would probably disagree with me a little bit probably. on that. Uh, you still like to color outside the lines, and that's okay. You do I it like in a new way. Uh, uh, so, Zach, as you think about that, what else comes to mind for you? Well, and, and that's the thing is, I don't know that we're looking, if I would argue that if the church is looking to be relevant in today's culture, uh, we're going to miss the mark, right? Um, it, it's not relevancy that we're seeking. It's an impactful way to be present and uh, hold sacred space for for people, which I think is way different than being relevant. Um 
I don't know, relevance is too consumery for me. But um, I, I, I think back to a conversation that I had when I, when I served in a, a small rural community and I was meeting with my leadership. And, you know, as all churches do, we began talking about youth ministry and young people and how do we, how do we um, get those folks through our doors? And, um, and, and really, I simply just asked the question, well, where are they? Uh, we know they're in our community, but where, the, where are they going? And, um, you know, through all of the conversations that every church has ever had, they're all always always the same. We dig back into the past of, well, when my kids uh, were there, you know, the moms helped out and, you know, there were a lot of volunteers and this and that. We didn't have to pay somebody. And um, as we went through that conversation, I had a, a guy on my leadership who was well into his 80s. He just said, hey, I, I drove around town the other day and he said, everything you're saying is true. You know, 50 years ago, yeah, we were able to do it this way. He said, but also 50 years ago in this small community, we had twice as many people and three churches. He's like, today? He's like, I drove around. We have half as many people and 10 churches. He was like, it's not a matter of not being able to do it. There are more options um, just in the church world, not even outside in the community and, and the number of options there. And he was like, we have to remember what, our community is now. It it has changed. And um, the fact that there are, you know, seven more churches today than there were 50 years ago says a whole bunch about how we reach the community and how we can reach the community and what that means. And he really started us down that conversation of here's what we were able to do in the past and how do we grow on that into the future, realizing that our community is not the same community today as it was 50 years ago, even though we want to believe that it is. It's like, it's different. And, and I always, always, that always just, that conversation is one of those that just echoes in my brain all the time of, don't forget to look around. Don't forget to uh, see, see how the world has changed, but also how are we moving in that? And are we changing and growing with that? Um, or like you said, are we holding on to the rusty relics of what, what once was, uh, and hoping that we'll go back to that. Um, and, and we won't, I mean, it's just not the world that we live in and we can be as hopeful, um, <laughs> we can be as hopeful as anybody else, but we're, at any rate in our society, we're not going back. Uh, that ship has sailed. And so how do we... How do we take the good things that we learned, um, the things that are that are great and moving and sacred, and move forward with those in finding something that is new and sacred and fresh, and and mixing that old with the new and and seeing how it turns out. Um, and I I would venture to say the biggest thing that we don't do as church communities in moving forward is being willing to fail. Uh, and Matt, I'm sure that you have said this um, at times in your ministry. And well, we've tried that and it didn't work. You've, at I know you've at least heard it. Um, which there are some cases that that's true. But also, maybe we tried it a few years ago. Why not try it again? Uh, or why not try something like it? Or just that fear of failure. That's that one's hard for I think for all of us. I don't like failing uh, as much as anybody else, but we can't let that scare us away from trying something, uh, trying anything, not even something new, but just trying anything uh, that could potentially reach a part of our community that needs sacred space, that needs um, needs the church. And so I, I don't know. I think there's a lot there. Um, in talking about legacy and I love, well, and I, I love the and saints I, and yeah. And, and I think that that's where it goes. Right? I also think that that's where it goes. It goes back to what we always talk about. It's about building relationships. Yeah. Uh, relationships with those from our past and those mm -hmm. from our, like what could be, you know, one of the things it would be really cool to do would be to invite someone in outside of the community who hasn't been here before and just share their thoughts, what they see, what they hear, like, mm -hmm. you know, um, whether you do that in a board meeting or in some kind of space, like, and just to hear 
just in a way to help you become more connectional, more relational. Um, and, and even then, like, um, we have to have kind of a, and I don't necessarily like the idea of it because of the negative connotations of it, but we, we have to have kind of a prospector mentality. Like, we've got to be willing to dig. Uh, even if we've been told that there's nothing in that hole, like, we've got to be willing to go down that way to find it, uh, to find it. Uh, or, and, and even to make those connections, it's like asking ourselves, like, what, uh, where are we not connected in? Um, and, and then equipping our people to build those relationships, making ourselves invitational, not just on Sunday morning, but like when we're in this case, like in my last church, one of the, my, one of, one of the, the coolest things I ever heard was hearing my board chair talk about how he wrestled with inviting people to church in his uh, practice. He was a doctor. And so, uh, one he figured out ways to do it in a healthy way, uh, and it took a little bit of discernment, but he made that important to him because he wanted people to be a part of. It. And and I think that we've gotten out of that habit. We've gotten scared of evangelism because it's been taken over by a certain group of people who've made it horrible. But you know, you you look back at the you look back at the church in the '30s. You look back at the Methodist movement in the '30s, and it was so effective because people laity stepped up and did the work we didn't cage a pastor in the office um, actually you never saw your pastor you may saw him once a month um if that um i've been reading father dyer's book and it's been really interesting to hear how ministry was done uh in, in his day and yet the church thrived because uh, they were willing to do those things and i think that's something we can learn from um, I, I think if we come from that early settler mentality of of building relationships in a healthy way. Like we have to do it healthy now. We can't, you know, we're not command and conquer, uh, but there is ways that we can build healthy relationships with our community. Uh, so when people know that we exist, um, and that doesn't mean that they come to worship, but it could mean that they come to a Bible study or it means that they come to a mission project or they come to a concert. Like we host concerts all the time here. And the amount of people that, that I talk to in the community and say, Oh, we love when you hosted that concert and this concert and this concert. And so like, you know, that's, that's a mission. And so helping the church understand that, like, how does our facility look when people are coming into our facility for these concerts? Like all that stuff matters. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's how we tie it back in the, to that is it goes back to, you know, the Simon Snick, remember your why. Mm-hmm. And I, I, and that's kind of what I've been doing over when we have the big 150 celebrations, I always remind us of our why. Mm-hmm. Uh, why are we here? Why do we exist? Like, why do we do these things? Our job, our mission is to uh, be bring in the love and light for our community and beyond. So, how do we do that? Um, and so, Zach, is is there anything else you want to say before we close up today? I think that's the thing. We we have to ask those questions. We have to look objectively and hopefully uh, at our churches, at our communities, um, in be willing to make the invitation, right? Uh, But also have something to invite people to. Uh, I think that's the hard part is, is we still live in a, in a kind of, if you build it, they will come, but also a, if people will just come, we can build it. Right. Um, If you're, I tell my folks all the time, if you're not excited about it, why should anybody else be? Um, And I don't know that we're, um, I don't know that we're fostering that excitement about uh, church, about spirituality, about anything here lately. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm excited about it, but also yeah. I think there, I think like you said, there's a fear of evangelism. Uh, maybe not a fear, but a reluctancy to evangelize. Oh, no, it's a fear. It's a fear. I, I think for some people, I think there's a reluctancy because of the harm that's been caused. Um, well, and the no. It goes back to what you talked about yeah. earlier, the failure. Like yeah. rejection. We don't like to be right. rejected. No, we don't. And and also we're not teaching people how to do Gosh. that uh in healthy and good ways. Um and and yeah, uh we we say it all the time, it can't just be the pastor, but I don't know that the pastor's doing it all that well either. And so I think I don't know. I think those are the things, those are the types of things that we gotta dig back into in our past and how do we how do we be like I said, be in relationship together, 
one is a church community, but how does that church community go out into the world and share that and build that relationship? Um, and, and stop thinking people are going to come to us just because we exist. Um, that, that world is gone. And so, uh, how do, yeah, how do we take that legacy out into the world and, and create that space wherever we are and, remember that the church is just one, the building is just one part of that invitation. Cause there's a, there's a lot. Yeah. There's a um, lot. Yeah. And I think that that's where, like, if you ask me, so this is the second church I've had a big celebration in, uh, mm -hmm. in Tahlequah, we did the hundred five years ago, we did the 175th. Uh, and this year I'm doing 150 here in Castle Rock. If you ask me which experience I've enjoyed more, I've enjoyed the all the different activities that we've had because that's allowed our focus to be broader and, and it's created the sense of community and space that we didn't imagine when we first started. So I was like, mm -hmm. I was really nervous when I said, we want to do all these things. I was like, okay, uh, uh, let's, uh, hey, let's try it. Like, what's it going to hurt? And what's been really great is to have that space versus a one off event to where you are hoping that people can come back. Mm -hmm. for the one-time event, the homecoming event, versus the doing out throughout the year and hitting specific different kind of communities. Um, it's been, that I think has been more fun is that we've been able to reach different people because we've been doing these different things versus the one event where it's like, it, it's, it's too much. And mm -hmm. so, if you're doing this, if you're getting ready to plan a big one, I would encourage you to look at doing like a year long thing uh, and, and, and have fun with it. Because uh, I think, uh, the, but but to do it in such great space and such great areas that you're not, and making sure that you're inv inviting other people to be involved with it, that it's not just the same three people throughout the whole year, because you'll run a racket. This church has done an amazing job of like literally delegating different things to different people and it's been amazing to watch that run right right and outside of the logistics of people and things right it's about honoring the past it's about honoring yes. where we've been uh and how that helps us drive into the future knowing we don't have to hold on to the things but we can still honor it yeah. and i i think that's the that may be the big the big thing right how do we honor the past but not cling so tightly to it it hinders us in the future yeah well, we want to thank our listeners for listening um, and uh, joining us today. Let us know what you think uh, in the comment section. Uh, also, feel free to like and share us uh, and then go to our website at beardedtheologians.com where you can find all of our great past podcasts. Pick up a few new items uh, for your new pastor if you're getting one or your old pastor if they're staying uh, or some other random person that you don't know. Uh, you can find all that on our website. We want to thank our listeners for listening. For the Bearded Theologians, I'm Matt Franks. I'm Zach Bechtold. Thanks for checking us out. I want you to subscribe and like this video and put that thumb, push that thumbs up. Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on all social media outlets. You can check out old episodes and more information at beardedtheologians.com. Thanks for checking us out.